together. What a joy it is to be in God's house with all of you today. A few announcements before we begin. Uh, This Monday is consistory, so please be praying for your elders and deacons. And on that note, we are still looking for volunteers to be candidates for elder and deacon. Uh, We request that you be in prayerful consideration about that. And if you are asked, I certainly encourage you to volunteer and put your name in for elder or deacon. Also, uh, bylaws. We have new bylaws that we will be voting on in November. I must apologize, some of the earlier drafts did get mixed up with the, the official ones. So if you look at your bylaws and it says work in progress at the top, just throw those away. Those are old, an old draft that is not the official one. Uh, I did double check and all the bylaws in the back are the current uh, official bylaws that we'll be voting on. So if you don't have one already, please grab one of those, read through it because we'll be voting on our new bylaws in November. Also, I'm sure you've been seeing all of those uh, news broadcasts about the hurricane that went through the south and all the flooding. Uh, We've been in much prayer, so we know what it's like to have a flood and a tornado, if not necessarily a hurricane, but please be praying for all of those flood victims who are dealing with all those damages and also mourning their loved ones that have passed away. I know it would be nice if maybe an inch or two got up here. It's pretty dry, but all things considered, I think we are quite blessed with the weather God has given us. So let us continue to be in prayer for those less fortunate. So with that, brothers and sisters, let us gather our hearts and our minds as we come into the Lord's house. Will you join me for prayer? Holy God, we come to you today. We are we who are called by your name. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you accept us, that you renew our hearts and minds, fill us more with your spirit, so that we may see our Father in heaven. Accept us today, we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God calls us to worship with these words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we worship our God, let us begin with a reading of Psalm 8. Psalm 8, for the director of music, according to Gittith, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Brothers and sisters, will you join me in singing number 230, Christ, we do all adore thee as we give our worship to Jesus.
Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbors and welcome them. So for the profession of faith today, uh, we are doing Lord's Day 45. Over the next couple weeks, we'll be exploring the Lord's Prayer. And so for today, I will read the questions, my daughter Annika will read the answers, and then at the very end, we will pray the Lord's Prayer together. All right, are you ready, Annika? Uh Why do Christians need to pray? Because prayer is the most important part of the thankfulness God requires of us. And also because God gives his grace and Holy Spirit only to those who pray continually and groan inwardly, asking God for these gifts and thanking God for them. What is the kind of prayer that pleases God and that he listens to? First, we must pray from the heart to no other than the one who makes true, than one true God, revealed to us in his word, asking for everything God has commanded us to ask for. Second, we must fully recognize our need and miserably, misery. So we humble ourselves in God's majestic presence. Third, we must rest on this unshakable foundation, even though we do not deserve it. God will surely listen to our prayer because Christ, our Lord. That is what God promised in his word. What did God command us to pray for? Everything we need, spiritually and physically, as embraced in the prayer Christ, our Lord himself, taught us. And what is this prayer? Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we pray the Lord's Prayer and reflect upon what it tells us, we ask that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we know what God's will is? Well, as a reminder and to teach us about God's will, will you join me for a responsive reading of the law? God says to us, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You 
you shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. As we continue to reflect on the Lord's Prayer, we also pray that we will be forgiven as we forgive others. So brothers and sisters, let us join together in making a confession of our sins. Let us give God the glory for the forgiveness he has given us so that our love for him and for each other may grow. Let us pray. Eternal and merciful God, you have loved us with a love beyond our understanding, and you have set us paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Yet we have strayed from your way. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, through what we have done and what we have left undone. As we remember the lavish gifts of your grace symbolized in our baptism, O oh God, we praise you and give you thanks for, that you forgive us yet again. Grant us now, we pray, the grace to die daily to sin and to rise daily to new life in Christ, who lives and reigns with you. In the strong name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, hear the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And all God's children say, amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, will you join me in singing number 571, Trust and Obey, verses 1, 3, 4, and 5.
At this time, I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our gifts. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come unto your house to hear your word. We pray that you be with Pastor Seth as he brings the message. May it fall in open ears, open hearts, open minds. We think of all those that are suffering from the ter terrible hurricane down to the southeast United States. Be with them. We think of all those that have lost loved ones. Be with those that are <coughs> in the nursing homes, hospitals. Guide, guard, protect them. Give them peace. In Jesus' name, amen. And just as we bring our gifts to the Lord, let us bring our, our prayers as well. Let us pray. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, O oh Lord, I thank you for this day that you have made, a holy day of rest, for worship, for rejoicing and gratitude. I thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, so that as we gather, we can be called your people, that we can carry your name and be called sons and daughters of God. So, Lord, I pray that you'll continue to give health to our minds, our hearts, and our bodies. Continue to give us eternal life to our spirits, 
so that as we go out into the world, we may proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And so, God, I thank you for the many miracles you have done for us, healing that you have provided for us. I thank you for the safety and the efficiency that we've been able to do with this harvest season so far. I pray that your protection will continue to be upon our far our farmers as they gather in the harvest. And when there are problems, Lord, I pray that you'll give them the wisdom, the strength, and the skills necessary to solve those problems. For God, we are so thankful for the safety and that, that we have right now. For we look at the news and we see our brothers and sisters in the south rebuilding after that hurricane and flooding, Lord. Lord, we mourn for them and their loss of home and also for their loss of loved ones. I pray that your spirit will comfort them and give them strength. May they continue to rebuild, Lord. May you give them the strength necessary to survive and live a life of gratitude and joy. So God, I pray that as we go out to the world, that we may be your hands and feet, helping our neighbors and even strangers that we meet know that you are king and that we may help them live a faithful and healthy life in this world. So we continue to thank you for our men and women in the military, those who put their lives at risk and even set aside some of their freedoms, Lord, to defend ours. We also thank you for our police officers and firefighters and other first responders who are the first ones to respond to calls for help. I thank you for our doctors and nurses and the hard work that they do so that we may recover from illnesses and injuries, Lord, But we know, God, that without your presence, none of that work would be, would happen. None of it would be fruitful. So I pray that your spirit will continue to give them strength and wisdom, give them blessing in their work, so that no matter what they do or wherever they're at, their work may be that of peace and of healing. And so we pray that you will bring your peace and healing into our world, for we see natural disasters, hurricanes and floods, tornadoes and earthquakes and fires and so much more. We seem to be overwhelmed with it. We also see wars and fighting. We see riots and streets. And we know that there can be no peace without you, Lord Jesus. So I pray, Christ, that you will come, reclaim this world as your very own, establish your perfect kingdom perfectly in this world. And until that day comes, until you return, I pray that you will send more and more of your Holy Spirit that you will build up your church so that we will be your faithful workers. Send us more missionaries like the Bruxfords, Lord, who are willing to go to the farthest corners of the world. I pray that you continue to bless their ministry in Alaska as they prepare for winter, Lord. I pray that you'll give them success in carrying the word of Christ wherever they are at, as they also carry food and other supplies to needing to those communities in need. We also pray that you will build up your church here in Chandler so that we may be a light in this world, your light, showing the world that you are Lord and that in you there is power and healing, forgiveness and acceptance. So come, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts and our minds. Come into our church and our town. Fill our nation and our world with your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us conclude our time of prayer by singing our dixology. This time, I invite our children to come forward for the children's message. Well, good morning, kids. How are you today? Doing good? Glad to hear it. Well, I want you to think really hard. Imagine the road leading up to the dairy farm, to the Rothers Dam Dairy Farm. Do you, can you see that in your head? Do you see that image? What, is, what kind of road is it? Is it a, an interstate road? 
Is it a tar road? Is it a gravel road? Yeah, it's a gravel road, yep. And is there anything, is, is there a special tree or a sign that you can imagine by that road? What do you remember? <laughs> Trying really hard. Well, there is, what? Trees in a mailbox. Oh, yeah, so that's definitely something you'd notice. These are reminders. These are signs that we're by our home. But if you aren't from there, you need something a little bit more obvious. You need a sign. And so leading up the gravel road to the dairy is a sign that says Ryler's Dam Dairy, right? With a picture of a cow on it. Do you remember that sign? You've probably gotten so used to it, you don't even notice it anymore. But if anybody was going to the Ryler's Dam Dairy, they'd be very thankful to see that sign because they know, aha, this is the right road to go to that dairy. Well, God also gives us signs to let us know that we are in his presence. And more than that, that we are part of his family. Because you're part of the Ryler's Dam family, right? You can go to the dairy whenever you want to, right? Well, maybe not whenever you want to, because sometimes you've got to go to school. Well, you don't really need a sign that lets you know that you're home, but we do need reminders that we're part of a family, that even if you're at school or if you're visiting a neighbor, you're still the Ryler's Dams, right? Well, God gives us signs to teach us that we are part of his family. We call these signs sacraments, and that's baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are signs telling us that we are in God's presence. We're in his house. More than that, they teach us that we are God's children, so that no matter where we go, we always know who we are and who we belong to. We belong to Jesus. And that is a great comfort, no matter what, where we are or what is happening in our lives. And so with that, let us give our blessing to the people. You ready? All right. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you, kids. Uh, uh, not today. Off to Sunday school <laughs> or children's church. Yeah, can't give them candy every day. All right, our children go to children's church. Uh, let us prepare to read God's word. Let us pray. Holy God, I thank you for sending us your Son and your Spirit. I thank you for sending us your holy word. And as you, your Spirit spoke through the prophets and apostles so long ago, I pray that your Spirit will speak through the word today to our hearts and our minds, so that we may learn to be like you, that we may know that we are your children, and that you are making us to be like Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Today's reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, brothers, about times and dates we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. 
Live in peace with each other, and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the word of the Lord. I'm sure all of you are aware of that Matthew West song, Don't Stop Praying. It's been a big hit ever since it was released earlier this year. And even if you haven't heard that song, I'm sure you've all seen those yard signs proclaiming, don't stop praying. They've also been a big hit this year. In fact, they're such a big hit that the manufacturer ran out of copies, and there is a significant back order, meaning that there could have been a lot more reminders to don't stop praying. Now, I haven't actually done any counting, but it certainly seems like there are more of those yard signs than there are for any specific candidate this year. And I find this significant because it is an election year. And while politics and voting are important, it does seem like a significant portion of America wants the world to know that there is something more important. Prayer, and specifically the one who hears our prayers. Now, it is a good thing to put up these yard signs, but let me remind you that it's only effective if we actually are praying. So start praying, and don't stop praying. Of course, this is easy for me to say. Many young Christians want to know, how can we pray? What should we pray for? And even experienced Christians want to know how we can become more effective in our prayer life. Well, over the next couple weeks, Using the Heidelberg Catechism as our guide, we will be exploring the Lord's Prayer. We will be learning how to avoid obstacles to prayer. We will learn what we should pray for, how we can be more effective in our prayers, and even how we can turn every moment of our life into a prayer. And so, with that, brothers and sisters, let us begin by taking another look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And it's addressing many of the issues that they were facing in that day. You know, things like persecution, confusion about the end times, how to pray, what should we do when we're out in the public. You know, issues that also are affecting us today. It turns out that Life in this world doesn't really change. There's nothing new under the sun. And so as we think about prayer and how that helps us be a faithful witness out into the world, it's always good to start with the Lord's Prayer. We, of course, call it the Lord's Prayer because this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It should be obvious that Jesus finds this prayer important because it's what he taught to his disciples. This prayer has also been important throughout all of church history. In the early days of the Reformation, the church in Rome accused Luther and others of being schismatics, but Luther responded that, no, we are the true church. We are trying for reform in the church. And one of the proofs that he gave to show that he and other reformers like him were a part of the true church is that they were devoted to the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps this is all history, but no, the Lord's Prayer is important for us today. When surveys are done of churches, they find that the ones that are growing are the churches that have a vibrant prayer life. 
and in these churches that are praying a lot, maybe you'd think that there's a lot of active prayer with hands in the air, people praying in tongues, but no. What is surprising is that these churches are devoted to silent prayer, coming together as a corporate body and praying together, one leading, the others are being silent. And the second factor of their prayer life is that they are also devoted to the Lord's Prayer. This prayer is powerful for us. It is a place for us to begin learning how to pray. And it's not the only prayer that we should be praying, not by a long stretch, but it is a good place to start, and we should never leave it behind, for it is the Lord's Prayer. And so when we turn back to Thessalonians, we see Paul addressing the many issues that they have, and we find this little line about praying continuously. Always be praying. Now, growing up, I was taught to fold my hands and close my eyes and pray. Whether I was in a group, then I'd be silent as, say, my grandfather or the pastor was praying. Or if I was by myself, I could pray. But it's quite obvious that we can't always keep our hands folded and close our eyes. For example, for driving on the road, I really hope you keep your eyes open and on the wheel. But how can we turn our driving down the highway into a prayer if we're operating a tractor or if we're teaching classes or whatever we're doing, cooking even? How can we turn these into prayers? That is what Paul is trying to teach the church in Thessalonica, to turn their life into a prayer. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Christians in Thessalonica had big problems. They were facing lots of persecution. But despite that persecution, they were staying strong as a church. But what was really tearing them apart is that they were confused about the end times. You see, Paul planted his church in Thessalonica, but there was a big riot that drove him out of that city before he could complete his teaching there. And so, part of his solution was to write the letter of First Thessalonians, as well as send Timothy up to complete the work. But because Paul did not finish his teaching, there was confusion. There were some who thought that the resurrection already happened. Oh no, we missed the boat, they thought. Others thought that those who died were going to miss the boat because they weren't alive. Jesus is coming, and only those who are living are going to be with him. They had many worries and props. The worst problem is that there were some who thought Jesus was going to come at any moment, and therefore, what's the point in working? Let's just sit around, wait for Jesus, and let the other people take care of us. Don't they know that Jesus is coming, and it's all going to be pointless anyway? These are problems that the church in Thessalonica is facing, and Paul writes to them, correcting them on their errors. According to, or in response to the end times, Paul reminds them that they belong to God. He reminds them of God's promise to be with us. This is from Matthew 28, which we just wrapped up the other week. Jesus promises to be with us always to the end of the age. No, we did not miss the end times. Those who die are not separated from Christ. Jesus has promised to be with us to the very end. So whatever is happening, whether it's persecution or a death or confusion in our lives, we know that Jesus is with us. Jesus isn't with us because of anything we have done, but because of his promise to be with us. And so, part of what Paul is writing is that we, in our personal lives, should live as Jesus is with us, and that he is going to come at any time. We need to be ready. So, there are some good moral habits that we should have. We should build each other up. We shouldn't lie or tear each other down. We shouldn't be idle, just being lazy. (laughs) After all, idleness leads to idleness. But at the same time, in our social lives, when we're out in the city, when we're out in the fields, we should be living as if Jesus has given us an entire lifetime. We should be thinking ahead, planning, We should be praying for the peace of the city. We should be planting trees. We should be living as if we have an entire life to live. More than that, we should be living as if our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren's grandchildren have an entire life to live. We should be living our life in this world 
so that they may inherit the good world that God has made for us. For this world is a good gift that God has given to us, and we should be thankful for that. And so, pray continuously. Everything in our life should be a prayer. When we're planting trees, that is a prayer. It is, one, a testimony that God is going to bless this tree and allow it to grow to fruition. When we're obeying the government, we, that is a form of prayer. For we're saying that God is a God of order and not of chaos, a lawful God and not a law-breaking God. When we teach our children, we are living our life as a prayer. When we're living out in our fields or at home, whatever we're doing, when we do it faithfully, with a good heart, with a view to build up each other and to give glory to God, then everything we do becomes a prayer. Why is that? Well, Paul wants to remind us of who we are. We are children of God. We are children of light. And even though it might seem that the night is all around us, Paul reminds us that we are children of light. We are children of God's light, and the day is coming. And so he reminds us not to get drunk, not to be in a stupor, not to be asleep, but awake and sober. We're told to put on faith and love as a breastplate, hope of salvation as a helmet. This is how we're supposed to live our lives as children of God. And as children of God, that means we're all brothers and sisters. We need to live together as if we are a family because we are a family, and the day is coming. So let me remind you, brothers and sisters, to be sober and alert. I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you to not be drunk. I know you. You're a good people. But I do need to encourage you to be in God's Word, to remind us again and again of who we belong to. We are in a dark world, and there is much in this world that gives us anxiety, that confuses us. They might make us want to become angry at the world. But remember that you are children of light. So put on love and faith as a breastplate and put on hope of salvation as your helmet. And so when we pray, our prayers remind us to do that, to remind us to rejoice and to give thanks in all that we do. For God is with us. Jesus is with us. He has given us his spirit. And so when we pray continuously, well, that's how we not put out the fires of the Spirit. Prayer allows the Spirit to burn brightly in our lives. When we build each other up, as Paul tells us to do, when we're encouraging others and even admonishing one another to avoid sin and idleness, we are praying continuously. We're letting the Spirit's fire burn brighter and brighter. We become a testimony to the world, and we grow deeper in our love for God. Now today we're going to celebrate communion. Communion itself is a form of prayer, where we remember what Jesus has done for our life. Now one of the, my favorite things that has been written about the Lord's Prayer comes from Calvin. When he talks about that Jesus is the substance of the sacraments. So yes, there's bread and there's the grape juice and there's the elders and there's me as the pastor and there's all of us. But don't be distracted by the things that we can see and hear. Remember, Jesus is the substance of the sacrament. And just as we take in the bread and the wine, it becomes part of us. So we become part of Christ. Jesus becomes the substance of of our life. So brothers and sisters, don't stop praying. Live a sacred life, and everything you do will be a prayer of thanks and praise to God, and a prayer of help and helpfulness and support to one another. Live a life of prayer, and don't stop praying. And when you don't stop praying, we become signs to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, on that final note about being signs. Now, I mentioned with the kids about the sign to the Ryler's Dam Dairy. Well, let's think about this sign a little bit deeper. As a way of analogy, there is a sign for Chandler as you come down the highway. Now, if 
When Jennifer and I first came to Chandler, we were very thankful to see that sign because it told us we were in the right spot. But the longer we live here, the less and less we actually need that sign. Everything becomes a sign that we are in Chandler. The way the hills are rolling, the uh, radio tower outside of town, a line of trees on a ridge, even the way the clouds kind of ripple over that ridge, let us know that we are home. But let's imagine for a moment that some prankster from Lake Wilson comes down, takes the sign, and puts it up by Lake Wilson. Now, does Chandler stop being Chandler? Or does Leota start becoming Chandler just because the sign got moved? No, not at all. The sign only has its authority because it's in the proper spot. So it is with our sacraments and with our own lives. The authority that we receive from Jesus is only gives us power when we are in the right spots. The sacrament is a sign that Jesus is with us, that he has given us his spirit, and that we are before the heavenly throne in heaven. It's also a sign that Jesus is with us when we go out into the world. But brothers and sisters, this sign is only significant when Jesus is present and we are mindful of him. So don't stop praying. Be mindful that Jesus is with you always. And that way the sacrament that we remember today becomes the sacrament of Jesus and becomes the very substance of our lives. So no matter where we are or what we are doing, we become a sign that Jesus is here. And that, brothers and sisters, is the very best news that I can think of. Jesus is here with us. So go out and bring Jesus to everyone you meet. To God be the glory. Amen. As a hymn of response, will you join me in singing number 516, Redeemed, verses 1, 3, and 4. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. 
With joy we praise you, gracious God, for you have created heaven and earth. You have made us in your image, and you keep covenant with us even when we fall into sin. We give you thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ, who came among us as the word made flesh to show us your glory, full of grace and truth. Therefore we join our voices with all the saints and angels in the entirety of creation to proclaim the glory of your name. And we say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Jesus Christ, we pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to be upon us. We pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. At this time, invite the elders to come forward and lead us in the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is our participation in the body of Christ.
In the same way, after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless is our participation in the blood of Christ. The cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks is our participation in the covenant of grace. And the bread which we break is our participation in the body of Christ. Body of Christ. Therefore, just as grains have been gathered from many fields and grapes from many hills into one cup, let we who are many be united in the body of Christ. Therefore, let everything you do be done in the name of Jesus. And so as you go out, brothers and sisters, go out with this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace. As we go out today, let us go out singing number 232, God Be With You. <laughs> 